Yes, you are in the right place. This is the sound bug. Uh, we're here to talk about sound. Um, we're here in the beautiful countryside of South Wales on a lovely summer's day, uh, here to meet Fred Davis of Axhorn Loudspeakers. Um, he's been developing his latest Axjet model. Um, let's go inside and meet him. Well, so we are rolling. We're rolling. Yep. Just as well it's not live TV, Fred. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be in big trouble. Yeah. Fred, I, I remember uh, first meeting you up in uh, high up in the Welsh mountains, where you'd built a house by digging at first digging out the foundations and, <laughs> and making concrete horns. Not far from here, just what? up in the hill behind. Um, yes, I. Uh, my friends thought I was mad. I, I found this lovely barn, and instead of doing anything else to it, I started digging the floor out, because I had a plan. And the plan was a Rex Bulldogs-type uh, base bin for each of a stereo pair under the two walls, uh, coming out under the windows, into the floor, and back out, 16 foot, 16 square foot uh, mouths, and uh, 40 hertz horns. And uh, I think that's what you heard. Eventually, you came and reviewed them. Um... I was a youngster then. And, <laughs> so uh, was I. <laughs> and, uh, it, it was a formative experience hearing Jimmy Hen. I can't remember what we were playing. It might have been Hendrix Live at Woodstock or something. But I, I, I remember you saying, "Don't worry, the nearest neighbour is three miles away." But not and, quite. But quite a way. It was astonishing to, to hear that you know Hendrix full scale. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. What, what I find uh, really frustrating, lots of good hi-fi out there. Um, you, you go to turn it up to a realistic concert level, and it doesn't cut it. It just can't do it. You can blow my speakers up. It's, it's, just, it's not bothering the neighbours much. It's just that it won't do it. It'll, it'll sound really wonderful, but that last little 10 dB, you know, the fifth gear bit, you can't do it. So I've always wanted speakers that will, will do that. Um, they, they, you know, I don't want a PA, but I want a, I want a, a speaker that really performs, and that's why I've always gone with horns. I mean, horns just give you something. You say you don't want a PA. <laughs> it, it, it can work as a PA. It's a high well, fidelity PA. Exactly, exactly. I mean, either way, I mean, when I, I've made a lot of PA stuff, I, I do stuff at Solfest up in Cumbria, and uh, we use these axe jets there pair on each side of the stage and a big bass bin, a huge 40 hertz horn. And um, uh, the, the point is that I have the same philosophy about speakers per se. If it's PA, it should be hi-fi PA. If it's hi-fi, it should be able to perform to a degree like a PA. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same thing, it's reproducing sound. Of course, these speakers because of their design and because of their sensitivity, you don't need an awful lot of power to, to bring the ceiling down. I mean, yeah, put put some serious power into these, you'd hear them a couple of miles away, wouldn't you? Well, you can certainly, well, of course, you can hear them in the distance, but you can actually play them out, out of doors on a, on a still day and walk 100 feet away, 200 feet away. The, the wave front is so clean coming out front of it, it remains integrated, it reaches the ear as perfectly as it left the speaker. That's the problem with so many speakers. You've got this punchiness and uh, reflex designs and different drivers and crossovers and different energy rates. Uh, the tweeter will die long before it gets to you, whereas the bass will punch out to you. If you walk away from a, a normal speaker 
uh, eventually you'll hear it going boof, 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 and that's it. Uh, you've lost everything else. With this, you've got this fully integrated wavefront. So uh, horns really, really project. I mean, but at the same time, as you say, um, you can you can drive this these AER drivers in with a with a three or four watt triode valve amp. So in a domestic yeah. setting like here, you yeah. you know, so, and you a, a real purist enthusiast, yeah, uh, happy analog any source, but you you don't have to have all the complex heavy duty amplification. Equally, you can you can hook it up to your PA amplifier and have it ticking over and feed it with a signal and wham, they work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and entertain your neighbours ten blocks away. Well, you can you really want, <laughs> if your neighbours want to be entertained. <laughs> but, you know, it makes it nice to be able to take them outside because so many, so many speakers die outside. I think, for, in many ways, for me, it's the proof of the pudding. If you can, if you can make a speaker work outside, then, uh, and it really performs to m many, many metres away, uh, you know that you're creating a, a wavefront. I mean, nothing comes out the back of these. You can stand behind them, you almost can't hear them. You have to think, oh, are they on? And then you turn around and you find, yeah, of course they're on. Uh, because all the energy is being projected forward. That's what makes them efficient. You don't, you're not trying to lose anything along the way. Anybody who's got the sound bug will have a, a lovely system at home. Um, yes, they'd be terribly disappointed, <clears throat> probably, if they then took that system out onto their patio. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I think is, uh, is really salient. It, it's a sort of lifestyle question. Of course, if we all lived in California, <laughs> it, we, it, we'd probably have a, a very different lifestyle. We would spend a lot more time outside. Living in Wales, as I do, it's limited to these lovely summer days and maybe a frosty autumn day, you know. But um, nevertheless, there's something really nice about having uh, having some outdoor time with the family with some friends have, 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 if you have lucky enough to have a swimming pool be able to roll these out and yeah. stick them by your pool and um, you can play your favorite music as though you were doing it in your listening den but your listening den hasn't doesn't have to be in one place it's a movable feast Rolling the clock back 25 years or so, Fred, when I first heard your massive built-in concrete horns in your home, um, I mean, you always dreamt of making horns out of concrete. You were making speaker stands, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think uh, during the intervening, intervening period, you've said to me many times that it turned out to be folly. So, um, yes, how, how did this one come about? Tell us about this latest axe jet? Well, I, the first axe jet started back in 92. So we made those then uh, because I tried to sell built-in speakers and uh, the world wasn't really interested. They didn't want to build them in. They wanted them to be able to have a speaker that you could bring in, take out, move around, um, which actually rather sort of moves away from this idea of spiking them to the floor, which is why I've gone with casters. Eh? I don't need them. This is a concrete speaker. This is made out of concrete. It looks like a glass fibre speaker because it's got a glass fibre shell. Ah. But inside it's made out of glass reinforced concrete. Right. Uh, it, it's got the mass, it's got the, the, the density uh, and the stiffness, and yet it's light with foam elsewhere. The, the back, the, the sculpted shape of the back of the axe jet is um, really just form following function it's covering the folded horn. And um, I mean, the reason I started to make this particular model, the previous model was, was nice, uh, it worked well, it had a louder in it, it was uh, not throated at the front of the driver, and it wouldn't really drive terribly hard. Uh, and I always sort of was a bit doubtful about it. It had a Tractrix horn, something that Bruce Edgar thinks a lot of, that uh, they tend to um, project from behind the mouth, so you don't get the full bass frequency out of them. And um, being used to that big, full exponential horn, I wanted to get as big as I could manage in a portable style. So these coming down to sort of 55, 60 hertz, um, at that point, 
you lose a little bit at the bottom end, but you gain so much elsewhere. It's all one driver doing the whole thing. And by making this afterburner that really compresses the front, it's a bit of the sort of, the sort of stuff that comes from PA work with uh, compression drivers, but it's not compression driven, it's front and reloaded. So there's a, a folded horn on the back, which is exponential, and there's a, a, a sort of multi-cell horn on the front in a way. The donut bit gives you a high-frequency horn in the middle that it, it does the work of the little parasitic cone. And then the annular ring is part of the same exponential. So uh, you're getting the, the full cone into there with the mid. So you've got really kind of a, a top, mid and base horn and they integrate about here somewhere <laughs> as, they, as they drive outwards. Fred, because you've had the sound bug all your life, um, I know that you've spent many years experimenting with all kinds of different drivers. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're using in this latest model. Well, this, is, this is the AER. I, 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 I've discovered and fallen in love with AER. Uh, it's a German mate, Philipp, Philipp uh, uh, Keller in Stuttgart. Uh, he's got the sound bug too, badly. <laughs> he's, he's been at it all his life, doing the same sort of things. And he, he fell in love with Lowther drivers and um, couldn't, uh, couldn't sort of uh, get exactly what he wanted. So based on the Lowther, he developed uh, his own driver. Many people have done the same worldwide. And there are very few full range drivers that you can really comfortably use. CS make one, Fostex, Audio Nirvana, Lowther, Bab. There's there's not many. Feastrex from from Japan, nine thousand pounds just for a driving. Wow. Uh, handmade. Nobody's figured out what to put it in yet. But the driver and the 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 horn or the enclosure are crucially. One and one and the same thing. It, it's like a Formula One racing car with a Mercedes engine in it. So this this is made in Stuttgart next to Mercedes. It's an AER. It really does the business. It's almost flat response, but we're using the M the um, B model. It's the, an MD, and it's the B model which has got base lift to give us a little more base out of the back horn because we're throating the front horn so tight. We're getting enormous. Um, efficiency. Um, I found that they're really, really good. I've used the Audio Nirvanas too, very nice in those black ones we, you saw earlier, and uh, they have that slightly American rock sound. It's not dead flat studio monitor, pure hi fi, mm -hmm. but they sound lovely. They sound really lovely, and they're pretty bulletproof. But these, these are just the same. And, and with this, I mean, I, I'm using a polycarbonate. Um, machined centerpiece and this is spun aluminium on a, on a GRP and a foam insert. That's all light but stiff. This is all concrete, solid, mass. It can be on wheels because it's not going to lose energy anywhere. Uh, normal speakers are spiked in order to lose the energy that's unwanted that you're trapping at the back in the reflex zone or in the sealed box. We don't want to do that at all. We want to get every bit of energy out of that driver, front and rear. They come out half a phase out of, uh, half a wavelength out of phase at the front here at the crossover frequency. So there's no interaction in terms of phase. And um, the, uh, the speed and dynamics of an AER is such that um, there's almost no hangover to anything. You, most terrific dynamics, the transient response is huge, and um, therefore little, little energy to put in. And this is what you've always loved about horn mount speakers, isn't it? It's, the, it's that speed and that transient it, 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 It's the nearest I find to natural true sound. I mean, you, you know, everybody knows, you clap your hands and wham, it, to replicate that is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. To get that in, a, in a, a, a membrane, in a in a speaker, in a diaphragm of any kind is terribly, terribly difficult. You hear lots of attempts to achieve it, uh, um, panel speakers, electro, right. electrostatics, yeah, so get very, very close to it, yeah. but they haven't got the energy 
to convey the rest of it. Yes, they, uh, so, so they sort of suffer a bit. Most speakers just don't get there at all. That's right. uh, and you, you compromise your hearing. You say, oh yes, this is lovely, but you're actually compromising your own hearing and pretending that you're That's hearing right. what you're not hearing. Yeah. And the brain is so, filling in an awful lot I've, as well. You know, I go to, uh, with, with uh, having kids growing up uh, over the years and going to all sorts of concerts and gigs, uh, we've been to uh, to rock things and to trance and techno things and drum and bass things <laughs> and um, time and again uh, listen to it and it, it's it's a real disappointment. Uh, it's just not kicking the way it should, and and yet you you know what it should sound like, and to be able to achieve that at home then with with your your personal stereo system is, is the goal in hand. Explain a little bit about what you call your afterburner. Explain the design of that a little bit. Well, I mean, it, essentially, uh, it, I wanted to, to throat down the front horn. Uh, a lot of this stuff is based on uh, an assemblage by uh, Professor Jack Dinsdale. Okay. Uh, fascinating, brilliant guy who, in, in I think it was about 1974, wrote a, a terrific series of articles for Wireless World that inspired many young speaker designers. And um, what he was doing was assembling work by Edison, Olson, all these old guys that were working in the 20s when valve amps could only produce a few watts. Mm -hmm. They had to get as efficient as possible. Of course. And this is why they, they, they used uh, field coil drivers. They didn't have the big magnets. Mm -hmm. they, they used light diaphragms so that any little bit of energy would be shunting as much power in real watts of sound out mm -hmm. as possible and the horn you've only to look at his master's voice it, it does it, with those little tiny diaphragms on a on a pin it could fill well, a room it could fill a room mm -hmm. so uh, here we are we can we have with a with a horn you've got uh, three four five six times the amount of energy out of that driver than you would have had by just having the driver on its own or in a sealed box but with the afterburner, I've, I've had to throat the front because in Jack Ninsdale's earlier designs, he, he really had a waveguide on the front okay. and, and the, the driver was fully open and projecting to the room. That, that works up to a certain level, okay. but at a, at a particular point, it stops working. The, it, it, it overloads because the back throat is, is quite small into what is like a saxophone at the back there. And the, the energy that it takes to push down that little saxophone throat, um, it gets lost by, by the compression and starts to come out the sides. And so the, the roll surround starts to puff out and it immediately goes into distortion and instability. So you can only get certain dB out of it. If you want to drive it harder, you have to take a sort of PA line on it and put a throat on the front of the thing. They have compression drivers, um, which are sealed at the back. Mm -hmm. They have a, a little horn on the front, and then all the energy is being pushed out the front as much as possible or absorbed at the back. Well, to f not absorb it at the back and have everything, you want front and rear, but we do need to throat the front. But if you throat it down just to a single throat, then you uh, screen the driver. So the driver is creating a mass of air and those multiple frequencies are getting too mixed. And, and you, you then find you get a, a, a kind of that, that coloured nasal horn sound that people say, oh, it's a horn, it goes like this. No, that's not what we want. We want to get as much energy out, but we want to maintain as much of the field of frequency as we can. So that centre hole does the high frequency from the parasitic cone, which is the, the, the sort of tweeter of the, the machine. The main cone is getting the annular ring, and that's the sum of the centre and the annular ring is the throat of the front of this driver. And it's a little bit larger than the back driver, the back throat. However, it, it balances. So that when you drive hard, the, the front, uh, takes the energy and the back will continue to work and you get a, a, a sort of isobaric 
pressure area, front and rear. And it's, uh, it's with exponential, and um, I mean, I've gone back to hyperbolic exponential. I think it's really the only, it's it Edison's original idea, uh, I think. It's certainly, all those old gramophones were done like that. And it works better than many, many of the other designs. There are a lot of modern, modern designs, um, and they were really, essentially, they, they were um, for dispersion. Uh, these CD horns, you see, they, they were a slot in them. They're, they're to disperse very, very high energy from a particular bandwidth. And they're not really working as horns as such. They're, they're sort of uh, dispersive. Because you've been uh, you know, playing around, so to speak, with, with horn loudspeakers all your, all your life, you got involved um, in the Glastonbury Festival right at the very beginning, did you not? Well, John, where do I, where do I begin? Right at the beginning. I mean, yes, I, I, I went there in 1970 before the big one in 1971. There were a, a few of us in a field. Uh, and uh, yes, it was lots of fun and uh, I got very involved. Uh, met Tony Andrews when he built his first uh, pre-turbo sound system in the garden at uh, Worthy Farm. Uh, but later on, I, uh, I you know, went there really just uh, as a young man for fun and get involved. And, uh, it was part of uh, our, our enthusiasm at the time. But uh, later on in the, uh, in the sort of 90s, I, uh, I got rather involved with the Greenfields people who wanted something really efficient, super efficient, to work on battery power, on pedal power, alternative energy. Greenfields ostensibly no generators. Uh, so uh, I designed up some 100 hertz horns uh, for them uh, and we put, uh, we put some in the, uh, in the field and uh, we put some on the stage uh, used them with uh, Mick Fielding and the Rainbow Dragon stage and uh, in Green Futures Field, um, I think in the early 90s. Uh, uh, we eventually, uh, with, uh, with pal of mine, Michael Dog, we, started, we ran the stage then, uh, um, produced a show, and at that time then I built a 40 hertz horn, uh, a compound horn with a phase plug um, loaded from 15 inch driver, a uh, couple of six-inch drivers, 100 hertz horns, and then lovely old Vitavox multi-cellular S2 drivers on the top there. 250 watts per side, 500 watts, pedal power. And um, it worked. It worked a treat. It sounded lovely. Uh, later on, again, we moved on to do Greenpeace. Uh, we chose 98 when it rained and it rained and it, it, was, uh, it was like the song. But... Then we had, we had a, a, a marquee with uh, kids uh, enjoying techno music right through the night, wiggling away in their wellies, stuck to the mud. And um, we did that with the same system. We had then a big dome with four of the earlier model axe jets in, a lot of, lot of live acts, a lot of DJs. And uh, we kept people occupied for several days and they all went away happy. Very, very salutary experience. I mean, I learned a huge amount about what sound systems mean. I, I did, like you, enthusiast, I'd always had a stereo, a decent stereo at home, very, old, very often old, last year's model, which I could afford. You know, I had old uh, Goodman's and uh, uh, Quad 2's and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I, I learned when you, when you sort of increase the scale, you don't actually have to have a power station driving. You, 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 it's all about the wavefront. You've got to create a wavefront at the listener's ear. Yeah. Yeah, we're sitting here, we're surrounded by four of these speakers now. We've got these two red ones and a couple of black ones, uh, just as a trial. But um, you can shunt those 50 feet away from you, 100 feet away from you, and you can get a very, very large, comprehensive stereo wavefront coming at you that's quite sort of headphone-like. We can all be in the same pair of headphones. Uh, we can get 90 dB at the ear. We can talk to each other without having to shout. But it's that 90 dB is a real full sound that we can comfortably sit and listen to at home. We, we can listen to it in, this, in a bigger venue. And I can create with these, I can create 100 dB at the listener, which, which is really dance yeah. centre of a nightclub or front of the stage when a rock band are playing. 
You wouldn't want to do that and for too long. You, you, one doesn't want to do that no. a lot. Right. Once in a while, mm. you know, you're having a bunch of pals around. Rather, your kids are having a bunch of <laughs> pals around, and they say, Dad, can we turn the stereo up and put it on? Well, most people are frightened of turning the stereo up mm, because they know perfectly well the kids are going to kill the tweeters. But you can't kill these. Turn them up, bang, they're on. And so they can come around and have a party. You might do the conquer with them. Uh, equally, you might once in a while want to get out your Frank Zappa record. I know you've got a few. Just a few. <laughs> what, one or two. One or two. And, and, and play it like the man himself is playing. Indeed. And really Shut your eyes and you're there. And you're, I there. Mean, you're there in the Hammersmith Odeon in 1976 in exactly. row 12. Exactly. Mm. And that's the experience I had with Hendrix with the Isle of Wight. Yeah. And I never forget it. It's, it's I'm not surprised. emblazoned there forever. Mm. Formative and experience. Once or twice, mm. I, I can replicate it very nearly. And it's worth everything. <laughs> um, one more little thing I want to get in. One nice little anecdote. Who's the musician up the road who's got the... Uh... Oh, yeah, I've, I, I've got a pal called Ricky Gardner, uh, whose music I've used on my website, which is very nice of him to let me use. Um, he uh, he wrote, co-wrote Passengers with Iggy Pop. He, he used to used to play uh, for a while as the bass player in um, David Bowie's band when he was doing the Spiders from Mars tour, I think, a long, long time ago. Ricky these days lives a, a, a quiet life in a little market town just down the road, and um, he's got the first pair of anxiets I ever sold, the original ones. Uh, he uses them in his studio because he likes the natural sound of it to mix on. He, he, um, he's got a little bit of a, a sort of allergy towards magnetic fields and all that stuff, so he limits the amount of technology he has. He, uh, he works through a pair of ADATs, but mostly he has valve amps, and he uses uh, these actuators, which are very simple to drive, just 20 watts or so, you know, and uh, he, he loves the sound, and it feels comfortable. And he's yeah. still making music. And he's still making music, yes, and you can hear it on the website. So, uh, Axjets, uh, what does it for him? And I, I, I agree entirely. I mean, I, I you know... Well, Fred, it's been uh, it's been great to meet you again and uh, to hear your latest creation. Um, if you want more information about uh, the latest version of Fred's Axe Jet, uh, everything you could possibly want to know, you'll find at www.axehornloudspeakers.com. And thank you for coming down. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we've had fun. It's yeah. I, I can never spend too much time extolling the virtues of all loudspeakers with old bells. <laughs> and listening to great music at realistic sound pressure levels. There you are. <laughs>